Uh, welcome, uh, Hamza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice for Scotland and the Scottish Government. It's our first ever launch podcast for Scotland against modern slavery. This is a real passion of mine, and I know it is Hamza's as well. This The problem of human trafficking and exploitation in Scotland isn't going to go away, but we're doing our best, and that's all we can do as humans to, to help eradicate this. Now, we've set up Scotland against modern slavery as a vehicle for the business community to understand what the problems are in Scotland and also how the business community in Scotland can work together to help eradicate this. So, first of all, without much further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Hamza. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first ever podcast. Listen, real pleasure, Sam. Look, thanks for all the work that you've been doing, uh, particularly in your your role as somebody who's involved in, in business, but also so delighted to be part of uh, this coalition, you know, Scotland against modern slavery. Um, it's not just for government, it's just not for business. We've got to work collectively together. So really pleased and, and thanks uh, for, for inviting me on your podcast. No problem. I'm delighted you're here. Hamza, you've, you're the you've many firsts in your life. You know, the youngest ever uh, minister in the Scottish government, the youngest ever cabinet minister as well. Mm. Um, so um, it, many firsts. And I think that's that's really important in society and business as well. That you've, you've made those milestones. Tell me, you must be so driven. What makes you tick? Do you know, uh, well, f- first and foremost, uh, that uh, awful uh, finance secretary of ours, Kate Forbes, has stolen my title of being the youngest uh, of, of all of these things. She came in a couple of years uh, after me, uh, but but has swooped in and stolen my title. How dreadful uh, of her for, for, for doing so. Sorry but to look, hear. I know. But look, it's, 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 you know, I've never been driven by... I've got to be the first ethnic minority in government or youngest in government or whatever else. What motivates me, I suspect, what motivates you um, is, is actually is my service to the public. So although you're in business uh, and, and I'm in government and I'm managing a portfolio, what drives me is people. And, uh, you know, it isn't about the the pounds and pennies in my bank account. Of course, that's important. Everybody's got a, a you know, mortgage. Well, people have got mortgage to pay, rent to pay, families to feed, all that kind of stuff. But what drives me absolutely is my service to, 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 to the public. And I think, I always think to myself, the day I wake up in the job, and, you know, it can be a fairly stressful job. In, in really truth, at times. Really when I wake up, if I ever wake up and I'm motivated by anything other than wanting to do the best for the people that I serve, then it's time to get out. So I'm, I'm driven by that. And, and look, I'm really philosophical about it as well. Shan and politicians are up there one minute, electro cycle, we're down there the next. So, yeah. you know... While I'm on that wave and while we're on that wave, let, let's let's ride it uh, to the best we can um, and, and, and advocate the principles uh, that, that I believe in. Absolutely refreshing to hear. I'm sure many of the listeners and viewers will be delighted to hear that. And to me, Hamza, it makes it so important because you mentioned it's about people and that is human trafficking, modern slavery. It's about people. There's no yeah. way of getting around yeah. it. And it's the misery of these people as well and, and how it can happen under our noses. And I think that, you know, kind of leads me on to talk a little bit about Scotland and, and, and the history of Scotland, because there's no getting away from it. Black Lives Matter, it's, it's been very, very apparent in the, in the news over the last few months that Scotland, Glasgow, Edinburgh, our big cities, has made its, uh, made, made its name through its connections with historic slavery globally through the Commonwealth. And I think, you're, you know, through the Americas and, 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 you know, there's no getting away from it. You and I are both Glasgow boys. You know, we've grown up going up and down Jamaica Street or past the Gallery of Modern Art, and we know that there's a history behind that now. But for me, personally, I understand the the past is the past. And that level of slavery, that historic slavery, is what I think many people in Scotland still think is what slavery actually is. Whereas nowadays, we can have it happening underneath our noses in the businesses, in the car washes, and the and you know, in many businesses, in the supply chains of some of the things that we may buy as well that it slips in there and that's really important to get across with Scotland against modern slavery so I mean I know that's something as well that you've spoken about in the past you know do you have any thoughts on that I, I couldn't agree more with what you've just said um it's fascinating I mean Glasgow has got on the one side a really strong presence and credibility around the anti-racist movement so you think all we did during the apartheid uh, movement, you know, the first city to grant Nelson Mandela its freedom, you know, uh, Glasgow University being, uh, you know, one that granted uh, James McCune Smith, you know, uh, the, the the first African American outside of America to get a medical degree at Glasgow University. So we've got great, on one hand, great anti-racist credentials, 
but you can't ever ignore the other side of the equation, which is that Glasgow is also the second city of the empire. I mean, it's not millions, it is tobacco billions and multi, multi billions that helped to build the entire merchant city, let alone uh, many other parts of, of Glasgow. And it's a visual reminder every time you and I go down Buchanan Street or Agile Street or, as you say, Jamaica Street, you know, any of these streets, it's a, it's a, it's a real visual reminder of us, uh, to us, of, of Glasgow and Scotland's role in, in slavery in days gone by. So we've got a... We've got a lot to do, actually, to, to one, recognise that, and secondly, make sure we educate uh, the g present generations about our role in the slave trade. So that's a very active conversation. But the, the, the other part of the equation that you mentioned, I think, is so, so important. You know, when I talk to people about slavery, modern slavery, human trafficking, most folk automatically think that my next sentence is going to be about what's going on in, in, in Commonwealth countries or what's happening in, uh, what's happening in, in countries in the African continent, um, but actually, I'm telling them we are getting referrals, and we'll no doubt come on to talk about this. But hundreds of referrals of people that are possibly being trafficked right under our noses here in Scotland, and it's a mixture of exploitation. We know that it's sexual exploitation, it's labour exploitation, which is the big one. Mm -hmm. It's coming from countries all over the world, and it also is including people who live in Scotland, are born, bred, raised generations of Scots and they're now being you know uh, imprisoned in, in in slavery absolutely and that's you know final point you made there is you know the, the fastest growing uh, ethnicity of uh, people that are trafficked are actually UK nationals to me that's the one that blows me away every time absolutely absolutely and and, and this is it and, 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 and you know again we can we can talk about this but you know it, it, it is something quite perverse that you know, there's people that have lived in this country understand what it's like never to have been enslaved in in a sense, now being uh, enslaved in such a way, and and the stories we hear are are truly truly horrific. Absolutely, yep. I've heard some of the stories myself, and it's uh, yeah. it's what, what what drives me actually. You know, just the, the stories make you more passionate about what you're doing. I think you know, in Scotland, we have. Um, Numbers that have grown as well. Not I think, I know that the numbers have grown. I'm sure we'll yeah. say we're going to talk about this now, is that we've had the biggest percentage increase, 125% increase in victims rescued and referred to what's called the National Referral Mechanism. Um, so that NRM, and for any of our listeners, I think maybe Hamza would like to explain, or I could explain that the NRM is when a first responder or uh, that, that person, the police, um, whoever it may be, is uh, identified as a victim of modern slavery, they are then referred into what's called the National Referral Mechanism, and that's when they become the statistic. So it's only at that point do they join the NRM. And then the Scottish Government have a whole load in place to protect and help re rehabilitate and support that individual uh, as they go through the, the, the system, which is, which is really, really important to get across. So the NRM is where these, these figures come from. We had 512 victims mm. last year, Hamza. Up 125 percent, and how do you, you know, I mean, what's your thoughts and what the, what's behind that increase and why it's happening in Scotland much more than years gone by? So, so I, I hope part of the answer is that people have more awareness of what you know modern slavery, slavery and, and human trafficking and exploitation is. So my hope is because we talk about it more in government, because business talks are more about it, because there's more TV programs, radio programs, and actually, unfortunately, because you know. There, there, there are examples that have been found and people have been convicted of some of the offences. You know, there's there's that very famous case, I think it's from 2018, of the four individuals, uh, Robert McPhee and, and, and a number of others that were, were jailed for a total of almost 30 years, actually, for, for, for slavery. Um, and, and, and that, again, was labour exploitation. That because these are in people's minds, then hopefully part of the hope is that they're now more confident in coming forward and knowing what the NRM is. And you explained it very well in terms of the referral mechanism. But the other side of that is 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 just, again, much like you, I, I'm just astonished, you know, because these numbers, again, will not be all the numbers of people that are possibly being trafficked. We know there'll be many out there that are not getting the support, not getting the help, don't know who to call. But this number alone, 512, of which we know 318 were referrals in terms of labour exploitation, but 512 in total of people in Scotland 
that is just mind-blowing and staggering. So the reasons behind that could, could be many. As I say, I've referenced some of the reasons. It could be awareness, particularly in the back of high court cases, etc. hopefully through government marketing. It might also, unfortunately, be, and, and this is relevant to, to, to the situation we're in at the moment with the pandemic, it could be because people are feeling more and more vulnerable in terms of uh, their own situations. Uh, maybe they're feeling like they have less money, cash, they've been made redundant from jobs, there's less opportunity out there. Does that make them more vulnerable to exploitation as well? So that's something we've always got to keep an eye on as well. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think there's a, um, there is some some evidence to suggest that COVID has had an impact. The, the yeah. Lockdown and post-COVID, whenever that may be, we'll see this increase continuing. Uh, one of the things that I found is that there's a, uh, when, when we're talking to businesses as well and say in certain types of environments that businesses look at communities as well. So this is, you know, maybe people from other European countries that have come to work and live in Scotland. And you might yeah. find in some environments that um, some of the locals, the local population that work in those places will say, well, that's just the way the Romanians behave or the Bulgarians mm -hmm. or the Polish behave. And I must say that, you know, I find that, I find that that's not acceptable as, uh, as, as we're all Scottish. And, Myself, coming from an Asian background, I know growing up in Glasgow that people say, well, that's the way that they behave and they just let, leave them to themselves and that's how they are. And, and, and it's not actually true because we all are one in, in, in Scotland and that's frustrating for me. Have you experienced of those types of situations yourself, Hamza? Yeah, look, I, I think we come across those attitudes really regularly. You know, I'm, I'm from the south side of Glasgow um, and, you know, if I was to go into Govan Hill and I hear some of the things... It's very fascinating, actually. Some of the things I hear things from uh, people who, who who are like me, they have subcontinent ancestry, yep. and they'll say things about Eastern Europeans that people said about them thirty years ago. <laughs> so the exact same, you know, misconceptions, lies, slanders yep. that were said against Asian people in the nineteen sixties, seventies, eighties, those same people are now saying, unfortunately, about Romanians, Slovakians, Polish people. Come, come 2020 and, and it's really dispiriting uh, and quite upsetting but, but but you're actually right what what that can do is it can mask um you know the the obvious signs that people need to look out for you know there's some really good awareness campaigns that are run by the likes of police scotland and the government jointly uh, in relation to spotting the signs of of, of, of human slavery of modern slavery yeah. and, and and actually if you allow your preconceived stereotypes to take over then actually you might end up not spotting those signs and that can be very harmful for the people involved you're absolutely right i mean i'm, I'm laughing here when you talk about people of asian ancestry because i have uh the family originally from sri lanka and i know that I, i've heard you know people from sri lankan community talk about oh those polish or those romanians or and you think not long ago not that long ago 20, <laughs> 30 years ago people saying this about you and then in a city like glasgow you know, you go back far enough and people are saying this about the Irish immigration that was coming into our city. So so you're absolutely right. Um, it's interesting you're talking about the red flags, Hamza, because that's something that, you know, I, I talk quite um, quite clearly about, I suppose, at a lot of the events that we've held in Scotland against modern slavery, but spotting the signs. And and that, it's not acceptable to say, it's not in my head anyway, it's not right to say, oh, well, that's the way they behave, you know, that's that's how they are. Because you'll miss those signs, as you quite rightly said. You know some of the red flags that we've um, we come across in the workplace, or somebody dropping off a number of people and picking them up, uh, somebody providing them all with lunch, control. Yeah. You know financial details, passports, national insurance numbers, one phone number for a group of people that we may be putting out to work. So, you know these are all the red flags that we look for and try to take people's unfortunately their prejudices away and say, well, no, it's not. That's you have to lay it bare understand so that's yeah. a really really good point made so t tell me about so there's some people might want to talk about or hear you talk about the human trafficking and exploitation strategy for scotland because we have when i talk to businesses out there they are they they, they find it confusing that there's the modern slavery act from the uk government human trafficking and exploitation act from the scottish government um and it would be good to get you know your view um on what the differences are and what it means and what the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act means and the strategy behind it. Sure, sure. H happy to provide, hopefully, some clarity on that. So first and foremost, it should be said, for all the differences I often have with the UK government, and, and they're quite numerous, um, 
on this issue, we work really closely together. And I'm really thankful for the good engagement that we have uh, with the UK government uh, on this issue. And, and, and so it should be thus, because what we're talking about ultimately is trying to ensure that we help the most vulnerable in our society uh, to escape modern slavery. So, so it's only right that regardless of what your political colours are, you know, political stripes are, that, that, that we work together on this. So th- 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 there's a good level of working with the UK government and, and, and on this issue, uh, probably more so than, than any other issue in my entire justice portfolio. So that, that's positive. Um, and, and in terms of our own, uh, he, 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 what actions we've taken here in Scotland, again, really positively, there's a good consensus in Scotland about tackling this issue. Nobody in Scotland... Uh, in terms of political parties have their blinkers on. They're all really positive about this is an issue, this is a problem, let's tackle it. So what, what and, and as evidence of that, actually, the, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act uh, that was passed in 2015 was passed unanimously. Um, you know, there was no party that dissented. And, and again, it's not always, you know, certain that you're going to get that legislation by any stretch of the imagination. So what did that act uh, do? What does it do? It creates two new offences. I kind of referenced this already, actually, in terms of one of the one of the high-profile cases, but it, it created two, two new offences, one offence of human trafficking uh, and slavery, uh, and, and the second offence of servitude and forced or compulsory labour. But what the what the Act also did was it required Scottish ministers to produce and develop a trafficking uh, and exploitation uh, strategy. So that was in 2015. Uh, so we did that, and 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 the the exploitation uh, the, the the strategy human trafficking exploitation strategy was created in 2017 or published in 2017, um, uh, the spring of 2017 uh, as well. And, and it essentially had three areas. Um, in it that, that it focused on. One was how do you identify the victims and make sure that they get the support uh, that they need? Um, how do you identify the perpetrators, which is a really important part of it as well. We can't forget that. Um, although the focus is large on the victims, we've got to make sure we disrupt uh, the perpetrators. And then is, is, is the more global question, how do we address the systemic issues around that, that, that allow um, human trafficking to thrive to, to, to grow and how do you work in that global environment? And there's a lot of good organisations in Scotland doing that. And and um, th- there's a fourth area as well um, uh, th- th- that is focused on children, which is really, really important. We don't lose sight of either. Yeah. All in all, actually, in each of those areas, business is so, so crucial. Uh, and again, I'm sure we'll touch upon it, but in each of those areas, business has got a big, big role to play in all of that. So a lot of the work from the strategy has been about engaging with the business community How do we get them to buy in, to understand what's going on? Because most, if not every single business, or at least 99.9% of them, want absolutely nothing to do with modern slavery. Um, What they don't realise, or some of them don't realise, is is that actually, although they might be confident in their own processes, what happens down the supply chain is something they've also really got to be conscious of as well. Absolutely. And that really leads us really on to the business community and and their part in all of this and, and supply chains. I mean, I um, so I would see that you know my passion behind all of this became, came from trying to exploit business opportunities uh, and and move our business more into the food production sector, and by doing a course that, that was dedicated to the food production sector, it actually educated me in something I didn't really know about and got me really frustrated and, and really quite passionate about it, um, and I felt that then as a business we had to do something about it. And that's where this whole Scotland against modern slavery comes from. And I think, as you mentioned there, and, and looking at the um, human trafficking exploitation strategy, you're right, you know, working with business is core to that. And one of the parts of, of raising awareness in the business community is, is is really important. And that comes under Action Area 3, one of the, one of the parts that you, you spoke about there. So we are hopefully launching the, the Scottish government's uh, corporate group to support Action Area 3 to help disseminate information from the government. Also, um, have a have an ear with yourself and 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 your and and your um, your cabinet colleagues with regards to the issues that face business with regards to this matter as well. So we've got open dialogue, which to me is brilliant, and that's what I feel is makes me so passionate about Scotland because we have a country where we can actually have a voice with the government and be close to the government and, and the matters that are important to us. And um, so we'd like to work together. So we're, we're launching the corporate group 
um, slightly delayed, obviously, and we'd like to get businesses involved and business leaders involved. But as businesses start to come together, hopefully as, as we grow and as we start um, talking to them, and there's a number of whiskey production companies, food production companies, construction companies that I've already spoken to over the last two or three years that are very keen to become part of all of this. What would you say are the most important things for businesses to be aware of and to do? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Look, let me commend you as a driving force uh, behind the group, but also the, the, those that you're working uh, with. I think it's so, so important that that business and government are working hand in hand here uh, to, to tackle this. It's not all the responsibility of government. It's not all the responsibility of business. Yeah. We've got to work closely uh, and align to, to, together on this. Um, for me, you know, I think the most simple thing I can say to business is this is not about placing any additional or huge additional burdens on you. Yes, there's now an expectation if you're a business of a certain size, turnover over, over 36 million, that you have that uh, you know, statement there uh, in terms of uh, modern slavery. But what, what actually we want to do, because as I say, the vast majority of business, if not almost all business, wants, has no truck with modern slavery or human trafficking and exploitation. So what we want to do is work with you to make sure that all your processes, your supply chains, the contracts that you tender, everything that you do as a business, none of that is facilitating human trafficking in any way, shape or form. And actually, you know, if we work collaborat collaboratively together, I've got no doubt that we will create the conditions where it's very, very difficult, if not, I hope one day impossible for modern slavery to thrive in Scotland. Now that does require some effort. You talked really well and you articulated really well the signs that people need to spot uh, in terms of potential uh, exploitation. It's really important that businesses um, have, have, have risk assessments in place and understand what are the signs as a business they need to look out for. See if I, See if you're going out to contract for a for a job, and uh, one of the one of the, the the tenders comes back and the price is too good to be true. I mean, you know, you know, less than half, but but the price is compared to everybody else. You might just want to question that. Maybe it is good business practice, but you might just want to question that and understand a bit more about why that's the case. You know, are they using, for example, uh, for, forced labor? Forced labor. So, 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 look, there's lots of business can do. It's not about placing extra burdens in business. It's genuinely about working with you to make sure you spot the signs and do everything in your power to make sure that you're helping us to tackle this. And that really fits in. Uh, you know, as I said, from a from a UK government, Scottish government, everybody's saying the same thing. You know, nobody is wanting to single out a business or somebody in the business community and scare them or you know, yeah. it's about working together and don't be, a, you know, what I would like to say in addition to that is that don't be afraid of um, putting your hand up and saying, oh, we don't know what we're doing here. We need some help or support because there is so much I know available in Scotland, not just not not just through government, through NGOs, there's businesses, there's charities out there, there the, uh, the GLAA, the Gang Masters Labour Abuse Authority. There's so much out there from all these organisations that can support and help any business, no matter what the size, turnover. And um, if you have a, if you have any issues and any concerns, that's what we hope to be able to do with Scotland Against Modern Slavery. You know, come to the holding, you know, we, we can signpost you, sorry, to the right direction that these people that can support and help because it's, it can be quite complex as well. But that's it's great to hear as well. You know, there's a, a real live government minister saying here, you know, he's not coming, not going after you. What he's wanting to do is help and work with the business community. And that to me is so refreshing. So it's not something to be afraid of. It's something to be part of. Uh, there's, there's nothing holding, nothing should be holding any business back from um, joining in and helping and contributing in some shape or form. So that's absolutely brilliant and spot on. Um, I suppose, you know, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic. I'm thinking of, of what's coming as well. Legislation changes are planned. Uh, it's coming. The, the, there's a consultation and, and a, a review of the Modern Slavery Act. Uh, the UK Modern Slavery Act was held. What do you think will happen and how long will it take? You know, we're all caught up in a pandemic just now. and or Actually, sorry, we're all caught up in today just if this recording goes out later on we're all caught up today and to find out who wins the u.s elections but and can you can you tell me you know what do you think that is going to happen with the legislation and what will it mean i thought you can ask me what's going to happen with the u.s elections that's anybody's guess <laughs> uh, right, right right enough but we'll, we'll have the answer by the time this might well go out um i uh, you're right 
I, I've been in government now for eight years and I have faced many challenges over that time, uh, many, many challenges, but never have I dealt with anything as challenging, as difficult as the current pandemic. It has sucked up every bit of government resource, every bit of government energy, um, and we are understandably so focused on that task um, because it is about the very immediate uh, and it's about people's lives. Again, on the day that we're recording this podcast, you know, the First Minister just, you know, well, a couple of hours ago did our daily briefing and just today 50 people have died, you know, 50 deaths in 24 hours. So we're getting to a period in winter where it's going to be incredibly, incredibly challenging and we will of course, get through this, but I couldn't tell you when. I don't know when the vaccine is going to be globally available. I know there's some good work being done, but I couldn't tell you when. So government has to be focused on this. So you're absolutely right. The UK government did consult with the Scottish government on changes uh, that they were making in relation to the Act uh, and the thinking of making in, in relation to the Act. Um, they, 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 some of those touched upon devolved responsibilities. Um, and we'll be very keen to take some of that forward. I think we're, we're, what might be different is that um, we're doing some good work on, on, on business, and, and I think there's some really good changes coming in that will, you know, there'll be a reporting period of when uh, businesses need to report in terms of their statement. Uh, they'll have standardized and standardized information, so that's helpful for us for collection of data. So there's nothing too onerous on business at all. I think what's interesting is what we should do about public authorities and public bodies as well. Many public bodies, public authorities, government included, of course, have far higher budget than, 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 than many businesses. And therefore, if business is having to do that, then, then public authorities and public service uh, should have to do the same uh, as well. So, so that's where some of our thinking is. I can honestly, uh, Shan, tell you with, 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 with much um, you know, certainty when some of those changes might well come into place, because at the moment, as I say, everything is on the back burner because of the pandemic. But I can promise you for this government, um, and, and, and I think I can speak for the entirety of the parliament in this regard, it still remains a, a real priority for us. That's fantastic. And you're right, absolutely right. This, this, uh, the legislation, uh, when it comes, it's, it's welcome. It's, it'll have uh, um, unity across all nations in the UK and uh, full support as well, it sounds like, from the Scottish government. So. Again, this is uh, music to my ears because it makes that message clear and concise and it'll get right get out there. Unfortunately, as you say, time constraints, COVID has um, created this uh, um, horrible, horrible time in our society. And hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, that we'll, we'll come through this and, and we'll come through stronger as well. But uh, yes, you're absolutely right. So, you know, um, Amza, you've been fantastic and delighted that you've opened this first first. Scotland Against Modern Slavery podcast, and um, you're uh, you're the the first again. So <laughs> you've another first for you as well. I must say as well, you know, you must stand as a inspiration for many aspiring young politicians uh, in Scotland as well. And also, I know that you're held in high esteem in the Asian community in Scotland because you're the first and you're 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 leading the way. So tell us before we finish, aspirations for yourself, people as your passion. Where do you want to be? Will you be another first in the future? Well, listen, listen. Thanks, first of all, for such a really kind words, and and, and I do appreciate them, and I don't say that flippantly. I mean, I, um, I'm afraid to say, uh, often on the receiving end of, of of a fair bit of abuse, racial, Islamophobic, and uh, frankly, just anything. People will just take a pop at you for anything. So it's actually quite nice to get the other side of the coin. That actually, t Twitter isn't necessarily the real world, and, and and out there, you know, it's nice to hear people say that they 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 they, they appreciate the job. Even when we get things wrong, and and as politicians, you've got to put your hands up and, and, and know that you're not going to get everything right 100% of the time. So so it's really nice of you and kind of you to, to say those words. I, I'll be honest, I, I don't plot my life out on, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a kind of giant um, you know whiteboard and, and think about what the next strategic move is going to be. I just get on with the job that I'm given, the task I'm given. Um, it won't be any surprise to any of your listeners, of course, because of the party I belong to that, that I believe very passionately in independence. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I really, I think, goodness, if anything, um, you know, last number of, of months or, or, or even a couple of years actually has probably shown that Scotland is, is drifting in a certain different direction to, 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 to the rest of the UK. So I won't bang on about it too much, but I'd love to be uh, in, in, in the first government of an independent Scotland. So um, maybe that's another first that I look forward to. But other than that, 
uh, I don't necessarily plot or plan uh, too much. Uh, we've got a hell of a job to do with the pandemic. So even even though what we're doing at Independence, which is our, our, our real core issue for, for, for us in the SNP, uh, that's on pause and, and, and everything is focused on people's health. And that's got to be the, the immediate focus, the immediate priority. Absolutely. And, you know, you've just related yourself, I'm sure, to many, many people out there listening uh, that it's their day job and their day job's got a whole lot harder since the start of the pandemic. And sadly, a lot of people have lost their jobs, and, mm. you know, and that's another issue that we face in our society. But the ones that have continued working have had to work a lot different, much in a much more different way and a lot harder. So it's, it's refreshing to hear that, you know, that through the sad circumstances, it's exact, you're just like everyone else. Just like Indeed. Okay. I'm definitely quite like that. And, 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 you know, it's funny because I was just on a call before this one and it was a, a video call and, uh, you know, uh, halfway through, it's quite a serious subject, but also touching upon. And of course, halfway through that, my, my one and a half year old who now has discovered how to open doors, burst into the room shouting, daddy, daddy. And it made me and everybody else in the call laugh uh, during the serious subject. And they were saying to me, we didn't know that happened to ministers as well, but I think it's important to remember as politicians, uh, we are just people uh, as uh, as well. Okay, well, delighted to hear. And I'm glad having an interrupted call by one of your children is a common common issue amongst many of us out there, hundreds and thousands of us out there. And I'm delighted to hear it's happened to you. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice for the Scottish Government, thank you so much for joining us today and opening thank our you. first podcast. I'm delighted for your time. Thank you now.